Thank you for inviting me um, to speak about uh, Public Service Commission District 3. But before I start, I definitely want to say that my, my heart is in a heavy place right now because as a commissioner, we often have to be concerned about storms. And right now, uh, it, it just, you know, I feel really, uh, I just want to say my thoughts and prayers with the people of Florida right now. Hurricane, uh, I think it's I Ian, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, we had Ida and now they got Ian. Uh, is bearing down on them, and I just hope families and the people they are safe, and I pray for their safety, and that they can recover well, and they, they minimal damage, and they can get through it. In short, I've been the um, incumbent commissioner, um, Democrat, um, elected uh, to this position uh, a few times, and I've worked extremely hard on issues such as uh, electricity, uh, water, gas, uh, sewer, wastewater, transportation, the, the issues are many. The district is pretty large. The district goes from New Orleans to Baton Rouge, including both sides of the Mississippi River, called the River Parishes, as it's known. Um, I will try my best to be as uh, brief but thorough as possible. I look forward to your questions and, and a lively uh, forward. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lewis. Good evening, and thank you, Vote, for hosting us. My name is Devonte Lewis. I'm a lifelong Louisianian who hails from Lake Charles, uh, but has dedicated my life to working for justice. Um, I started my career challenging Bobby Jindal when he was raising tuition and cutting higher education and trying to merge UNO and SUNO. I became an elementary school teacher because I believed in the importance of giving our young people a shot and at a future. And finally, I've been spending the last six years on the front lines of fighting for racial justice and economic justice in public policy. I believe it's a human right that everyone have access to clean air, fresh water, a cool house in the summer, a warm house in the winter, uh, and utility bills that do not push them further into poverty. But sadly, our storms are getting stronger and our power grid is unreliable. I believe this is the time for bold solutions and for the next generation of leaders to come up because we must clean up our grid. We need to protect ratepayers. We must tackle corruption and we have to invest in green jobs. We cannot wait, Louisiana cannot wait, and I am hoping to be that change agent to ensure that our future is brighter, stronger than it has ever been. I look forward to talking with you and sharing more about why I'm in this race and who I am, and once again, thank you for hosting us tonight. Thank you, Mr. Manning. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. It's good to be here with you. I want to thank you all for coming, giving up your evening. Also, to vote for hosting this on tonight. Listen, um, what I believe right now is that we are at an opportunity to restore power to people. And what do we do that? We do that by utilizing what's in our hand. This is a historic election, only comes around six years. The people of the state of Louisiana need to know how much power and authority that the PC, uh, that the PSC has to make some significant changes in our life. What's in our hand? The ability to make sure that our utilities are accountable, that they're affordable, that they're reliable, that they're renewable, and that they are governed by being equitable. And uh, I intend to do that all of my career. I've always been a change agent. I've not been a professional politician. I've not run for anything, but I believe now is that moment where we need a agent who is set upon making change. I've done that significantly, and I look forward to telling you more about that tonight as we focus on restoring power to people. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Well, good evening. My name is Willie Jones, and I am also a lifelong resident of New Orleans. Um, I'm in this race simply because of your mother and my mother, and your aunt and my aunt. I think it's very, very unfair that we have to deal with um, sky heights of, of, of electrical bills, and I think it's unfair that we have to deal with rolling blackouts in the middle of a heat wave when we have residents and citizens of New Orleans that depend on life support machines just to get by, just to survive. 
it is unfair for us to continue to deal with um, skyrocketing prices. It is unfair for us to deal with with, with, with rates that's, that's unbearable and that's unexplainable to us. It's not fair for us to, as rate players to constantly take on the barrier of everything for energy. And I look forward to explaining um, energy bill to you more and in more details as this um, process goes on. I'm open to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much to everyone who gave your very thoughtful opening remarks. We are going to begin with questioning at this time. And again, I just want to reiterate that we will be doing this in alphabetical order. Okay, question number one. The P this PSC district is similar in shape to the second congressional district and is gerrymandered to create a very unique district in the Public Service Commission. So this will be a two-part question. First, could you tell us what differences and similarities you see between PSC District 3 and other districts? And second, do you believe these differences have an impact on your positions on particular issues? How or how not? I guess it's my job, right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, you know, it's a two-part question, but I think you uh, pretty much answered it. One is if, if it's two parts, do I get two minutes each to answer? All right, here we go. All right, first of all, the PNC district is, as I described in my opening, a district that it, it, it doesn't really meander. It's pretty straightforward. It goes from New Orleans to Baton Rouge, both sides of the river. It doesn't have any fancy shape to it or anything that's out of the ordinary. But what it does include is the two major cities in Baton Rouge, I mean in Louisiana, uh, Baton Rouge and New Orleans, and in the rural areas of the river parishes. And one thing that's important about that is that um, those areas uh, are, have more Democratic voters than some of the other districts in other parts of the state. Most of the other state is Republican. In addition to that, you probably have more African Americans in those districts, in the district, district three. Um, otherwise, uh, and there, there's other elements to it. It's not only an urban district, but it also has some of most of the industry, uh, industrial plants and other things along the river that are included in the district. Um, I basically don't have the time to, to describe that. The difference on the position, sure, when you're elected, you're accountable to the people you serve, okay? And when you run, you're accountable to the voters who, who, you, who you expect to serve. And, I, and I've done that, I've served the people of this district very well, and I've been elected by this district over uh, several times. And so yes, it does have some impact. But on a personal note, I think the impact, uh, it doesn't change who I am. Because I believe in the things that are important to me, such as renewable energy, uh, such as helping people. Well, stop. She stopped me. Thank y'all very much. Yes, I mean, I think we have to acknowledge the fact that this district is very gerrymandered. Uh, I, I was one of the fighters and leaders uh, who was working to ensure that we had an equitable map. But sadly, um, with only five seats, uh, we ran 4,000 models and we could not create another African-American majority seat in this state. Uh, but what, let's talk about what those differences are. Uh, majority of the PSC is, as I said, is five seats. It's split up. Uh, district 3 has 10 parishes. Only two parishes are whole. If you look at the majority of the other districts, um, they have majority whole parishes because this district runs a line and captures African-American voters uh, from West Baton Rouge through the river parishes uh, to New Orleans. Uh, so what does that mean? It means that when you represent and own this seat, uh, you are not only a voice for District 3, but you are a voice for mostly uh, black individuals in Louisiana and Democratic voters in Louisiana because it's one of the only Democratic seats that we have on the Public Service Commission. Uh, so that means that I take the responsibility of listening to this district, but also being a representative voice for the entire state. Uh, because we know for a fact that white supremacy and the majority has made sure that black voters don't have access and have equal representation. Which means this seat is representing black votes in Shreveport, uh, black voters in Lake Charles, black voters in Lafayette. Um, and so I think what this challenges me to do is ensure that when I am talking about equity and I'm talking about equality and fairness and justice, that I'm not solely talking solely about uh, East Baton Rouge through New Orleans, but the entirety of our state. 
Thank you for that question. Um, when we look at the fact of what District 3 represents, we're representing uh, people who are largely African American, people who are mostly in poverty, uh, people who are uh, mostly uh, have a lot of incarcerated people in their families, amongst their friends and their children, that we are charged to look out for. We represent them. District 3 is also uh, have a, has a majority of people has the greatest amount, I'll say, of greenhouse gas exposures in the river parishes of St. James and St. John than any other district. Differences are that we got uh, District 3 and different 4, or four that are uh, largely uh, 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 progressive and the other ones are not, Republican and Democrat, but uh, our, our goal as a commissioner is to make sure that we represent all the people. What you need to look for in a commissioner is someone who's dedicated to being out in the field, upriver, downriver, all over those 10 parishes, seeing them there, talking to the constituents no matter who they are, black, white, poor, rich, in industry, not in industry at all times, and that's the impact that I want to have, to be present. Thank you. I'm going to use the same um, answer that I used in your survey, um, and I think Commissioner Bossi kind of like touched on the same answer that I had, and that is that um, District 3 has more industry um, in, in District 3 than any other district, as well as as far as these companies. I will represent the people of District 3 as well as the companies of District 3 because you got to look at it, you got to think about the company need representation just like the individuals, just like the residents because they put it back in our community, they're feeding our community, they, they, they're employing our community. So yes, indeed, that um, District 3 is kind of unique and it is have, have, a, have, have a slight Wigger to it, but you have to represent both business and residents of District 3. And we do, as District 3 representative of Public Service Commission, will be fighting and representing more business in Louisiana than any other district as a PSC. Thank you. Thank you for that, gentlemen. Most people in the South, in South Louisiana and around the world agree that Earth is currently facing a climate emergency. With the intensity of hurricanes and flooding events becoming more severe, a continuously eroding coastline and fragile grid powered off mostly oil and gas, we need leaders who will face the crisis at hand with practical and immediate solutions. If elected, what will you do to aid in the transition to a net zero grid? And what does your ideal time line look to in this situation, in, in this transition look like? Also, how will you work to ensure our grid and utilities are properly weatherized to prevent mass collapse of the grid like we saw during Ida and previous hurricanes? We can start with you, Mr. Bush. That was kind of a compound question, too. <laughs> If, he, if elected, what will you do to aid in the transition to net zero? Okay. And it was a second part, right, that you went on to do? Uh, no. Oh, well. And what does your ideal, yes, I'm sorry. And what does your ideal timeline to this transition look like? And also, how will you work to ensure our grid and utilities are properly weatherized to prevent mass collapse of the grid like we saw during Ida and previous storms. Uh, I'm gonna cut right to the chase. Uh, we don't have much time to answer the question, so I, I said I would be as succinct as possible and as clear. The um, <coughs> way you address climate change, uh, the, the main issue is carbon, carbon in the atmosphere. Now, Louisiana has um, a top heavy natural gas uh, generation for power. Natural gas is a, is a petroleum product that does produce carbon. It produces much less carbon than coal, but it still produces carbon, and we should strive to be net zero as part of, as you mentioned. Uh, so since I've been on the commission, I have fought and fought and fought for solar energy and renewable resources. We have hydro, we have some solar, but I thought that we needed more and enough. And I've, and I've been fighting for that from the city of New Orleans and Baton Rouge uh, stronger than anybody at the commission. Um, but right now, the, the fruits of my labor are paying off. Right now, we have solar growing at a, at, at a astronomical rate. 
uh, the, the, the message got through. The people want it, the businesses want it, and the companies want it. Right now, there are almost 100 projects in the works in Louisiana to build solar. We are, we are not building any, any uh, uh, petroleum plants. Some of them are already in the pipeline being worked on. And, but all, even those have solar components to them and renewable uh, components to them. So that's the first thing. The other thing, the timeline, uh, if, you, if you listen to the uh, Paris Accord, there are certain uh, uh, benchmarks that have been reached, such as uh, 2030 and 2050. I think the timeline is yesterday. When I first entered the commission, I, I, I entered the commission and I took a movie that was just for not long released by Al Gore, and I played it for everybody at the commission. It's called Inconvenient Truth. So I started then. And so we are behind. It ain't in the future. The timeline is yesterday. Thank you. We, we can't wait any longer for uh, the state to address what we know is a rapidly changing climate. Um, as I said in my opening, we know our storms are getting stronger. This is why one of the first things I would do uh, is really push for what we call a renewable energy portfolio standard. 37 other states do this, which is how we transition from oil and gas to using 100% renewable energy. Um, I believe that we need to do this uh, very fast, and we should follow the Louisiana Climate Action Plan that would get us there to 2035. And what this would do is that means we would create a plan how we wrap up going to renewable energy over time. We would look at duration. Um, we would talk about compliance, and we would talk about penalties for non-compliance because we can talk about doing it, but we need that plan of how we do it because we know the challenges uh, that face our state if we do not act. Um, it was reported that by 2050, we could lose upwards to 50 miles of our state's coastline. And that means we as a state have to truly act. But how do we continue to act, and especially protect um, in weatherization? It means we have to start holding those in power accountable. We can no longer let the rich and powerful corporations dictate our political system and dictate our leaders in how strong they are on their accountability. Um, so what we have to do is really hold Intergy and some of these companies to the line on the promises that they have made to our state and the harm they are doing to our state by their inaction. Energy has made more money in the last two years than ever, and we have not seen those benefits because we need accountability to them. Uh, restore power to the people, what's in your hand. The number one thing that's in our hand is accountability. What we need is a commissioner who has made a pledge not to take any campaign contributions from any entity that the Public Service Commission regulates. We cannot have someone in office that is at the same time getting campaign contributions from entities like Entergy. Uh, and, and if you don't know, look it up. See what those who are in office right now are getting. Most of them are getting 80% of their campaign contributions from entities that they're supposed to regulate. If we're going to begin to address effectively climate change and begin to move towards renewable energy sources, then we can't have our hands in the pocket of energy. Get, get me right. Entergy does not want your utility to bill go down. They don't want to make the shift towards renewable because they know that natural gas and nuclear cost more than renewable energy. And what do they want you to want to sell you? They want to sell you the most expensive thing so that we'll go broke giving all of our money to Entergy. So the first thing is with accountability is having someone who is a change agent like myself sitting in that office keeping the pledge that I made when I first uh, qualified that I would never take not one penny from any entity that the Public Service Commission is regulating and I plan to keep that promise. That's the first step to moving towards renewables. Listen, 85% of energy uses is the natural gas. That's how they generate, that's how they create electricity. And they use 85%. The rest is fossil fuel. Um, you can talk about renewable all you want to talk about face become blue. And I'm for renewable, but energy only have 2% of renewable right now. So in the energy of Louisiana, in the energy of New Orleans, it, it, it's who supply our energy. Now, are they willing to move into renewable? Not right now, not with 2%. Not when 85% of natural gas generated 
our electrician, and then we wonder why our electric bill is so high, our utility bill is so high, because we pay for, we pay for the, um, the uses, we pay for the, um, the natural gas use, we pay for kilowatt. If you look at your bill and you realize your bill, just in June, if you used over 1,000 kilowatt, that was an addition, 25 hours added to your bill. From Idle, from Hurricane Idle, NDG came before the Public Service Commission and received $5.2 billion for the infrastructure that was destroyed during Idle. After that, they come back and they say, let us apply another $15 to the red pills bill for the next 15 years. And you wonder why your utility is so high. And I would, I would force them to act on the resilient plan to harden their grid and to maintain their grid. Because that's, that's the killing point. You can harden your grid, we can put money into it. Thank you, Mr. You're Jones. You're doing the infrastructure. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Jones. I'm so sorry, we have to move way. on. <laughs> yeah, okay then. Thank you all so much for those responses. I'm gonna go in with the next question and we're gonna begin with someone differently this time. We're gonna shake things up a little <laughs> bit. So um, the next question is, is Hurricane Ida taught us that no matter how much money we spend on a service, and I believe this is gonna be a great segue from the last question. Hurricane Ida taught us that no matter how much money we spend on a service, for-profit entities can easily cut corners, fail to maintain their equipment, <clears throat> and wait on a disaster bailout from our federal tax dollars. In your opinion, who is to blame for Intergy's transmission tower crumbling in the wind, and what are the appropriate repercussions? So I'm going to begin with Mr. Manning. <clears throat> Restore power to the people, what's in our hand? Reliability. We have more power outages than any place in the United States, and this is unacceptable, point blank, period. People are dying, people are hurting because our power goes out and we don't know what it is. It goes out because of rain, because of birds, trees, and branches, and we gotta do something about it. Uh, it's the, 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 the commissioner's responsibility to make sure that Entergy is held accountable for giving us unreliable service. Entergy should have a penalty that we begin grading them on how many power outages we have. The more power outages we have, the worse score that they get, the worse grade they get, then that means that they get a penalty and you get a rebate. No power, no pay. So if we're paying a maintenance fee on our bills, they need to make sure that we get a product from them, which is what we're buying, that is extraordinary. We shouldn't uh, be getting a product that is inferior. So absolutely, we, there should not have been uh, and during Ida, any, any case in where there's 60 or 70 miles per hour winds and everything goes down, that tells me that someone was not holding them accountable for, for keeping up on the maintenance they should have been keep, keeping up on all along. And I'll tell you this, when the power does go out, there needs to be a backup plan, like the community lighthouse project that I'm a part of that is going to make sure that there are hubs so that when the power goes out, each of us are within a mile from a place where you can go to stay cool, you can go to charge your phone, you can go to keep, get medicine, you can go to uh, be able to get resources that you need. There needs to be a backup plan, and the federal dollars coming down can help us have that. But who's responsible? The commissioner is responsible for not holding energy uh, 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 feet to the fire when it comes to maintenance. Thank you. I'll have Mr. Lewis answer next. Yes, I mean, I think what we have to recognize is that the PSC has complete jurisdiction over the accountability of Intergy and these companies. And when I think who's to blame, I believe it's shared responsibility. Um, it is the company, but it's also the regulator. Uh, I was a former teacher. Um, and when my students didn't make the test um, and they didn't perform as well, I bear that responsibility just as much um, as that child or their parent did. I mean, what we have to see is a, a, is a public service commission uh, that is really holding the entities accountable. I mean, I think when we talk about uh, the maintenance of programs, uh, we need to be ensuring that maintenance happens not after a storm, but is continuing throughout the year. 
Uh, we need to be looking at maintenance in March, in April, in May, not just in September or October or November after we have seen a storm and after we have seen the power go out. Uh, so I think when it comes towards that, it is really holding the feet to the fire to the people at hand. Um, and I agree with that, uh, with Reverend Manning, that uh, that means that we have to separate ourselves to ensure that we are independent uh, from those entities. And that's why I have also pledged, um, and I am not taking a dime from the entities that I'm regulating, because I strongly believe that to hold someone accountable, you have to have your distance uh, from that entity. Uh, but what we have to do when we talk about it more is we have to look at federal resources. We have to ensure that energy has a plan um, that is protecting their equipment, maintaining their equipment, and utilizing new technology. Um, we, we have to talk about the investments of burying our, our lines underground and not just continuing on with the same model that we've used for the last 50, 60 years. But that comes with an accountability because that means it's not just about what they tell me they're going to do, it's about what I ask them and how they're going to do it and ensuring that they have a plan that is improving our lives but also protecting our grid and ensuring that we have reliable power because we know, as I said in my opening, this is a human right and we should treat it as a right. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Mr. Jones, would you please respond to the question? Yes, thank you. I think um, your question end with some of the things I was saying in my previous answer um, before I asked the um, ent entity. To me, entity realized and they understand that they don't have any skin in the game. They know if the infrastructure go down, they march right before the PSC and they create a number of what it costs to replace or repair and put it in front of the PSC. Like I said, Ida was $5.2 billion that they came for infrastructure repair. And like I said, then they turn around and ask to put a $15 additional charge on the ratepayers' bill for the next 15 years, which if you realize, if you pay attention to your bill, um, back in April, maybe June, um, Katrina just dropped off. So Katrina dropped off, I had to add on, um, and I realized that they need to be put in a program, put in a place where they need to maintenance. Why? Because I dealt with it for the last eight years, and this time I bought, um, like they said, like Grandma used to say, show me some pudding, um, there's no pudding in the pie. where well, this grid is in front of my door. That's, that's underground grid, which sunk. Last eight years I've been dealing with this. My wife has done bust three times because they don't make it. If they, I, I called them and I called them, and still I'm dealing with this in front of my driveway. That's why I know they don't make it. This year, they replaced the lights in front of my mom's house. They replaced the lights, and they haven't been back out in three years. This light been up. This light was worked it for one week. So if you was making it and keeping up with your equipment, you would know these simple things. So why are you gonna keep coming before the tax bill and the rate bill begging for money to repair your infrastructure and your grids, but you're not maintaining them? Thank you, Mr. Jones and Mr. Bassier. Great question. Um, uh, would, you, would you be so kind to repeat the question after all the answers? I just wanna make sure I have the question. Sure, not a problem. The question is, in your opinion, who is to blame for entity's transmission tower crumbling in the wind? And what are the appropriate repercussions? Okay. Great, great question. Now, I, I want to answer, but I also want to get some of the rules straight. Now, all my opponents, they have yet to say my name, but we know who they're talking about. I really want to respond to all the things they're saying that are just not accurate. Uh, but I'm not, I just want to be clear, the, the things that I've heard are preposterous. They sound good, but if you know how things really work, you know, most of the things that they're saying are just unattainable. Not unreasonable, but just untrue. Now, what I'm saying about that is, and I'd like to try to answer the question the best way I can, every suggestion that was made would cost the ratepayers money to change, and that would appear on your bills. So everything they talked about was just make your bill go sky high. If you want me to explain what happened to me. And so, uh, when we talk about accountability, which I think is a great point that they bring up, I need to hold my opponents accountable for the truth right now. And to be accurate. Let me be perfectly clear. If the, uh, 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 some of the things I heard are just 
ridiculous, you know, it's not going to work. They're great ideas, but they were just driving the prices. For example, when the tower that fell across the New Orleans transmission system went out, that tower um, wasn't necessarily poorly maintained, but it was very old. It was built over 70 years ago. That's nobody's fault. That's just old infrastructure. Now, had we replaced it, or we ordered them to replace it, that would have been almost a billion dollars on ratepayers' backs to replace the transmission lines that are working. Now, unfortunately, those transmission lines were built uh, 70 years ago when the strongest storm that was hitting New Orleans was a category one or two. And they were designed for that. But if you've been paying attention to storms, which we do not regulate storms, I know we're a powerful group, but we can't make hurricanes come and go. The storms that are coming in now are not birds or breezes. Um, these are hurricanes, fours and fives. Ida was a damaging storm at over 175 mile an hour winds. Man has not built a structure that can withstand these type of weather events. So to say you're gonna build it and all this other stuff, all you're doing is spending money and Mother Nature's gonna come and knock it down anyway. We can talk about maintenance if we want. What we have to talk about is resiliency. And right now, less than one year after eight transmission towers went down, they're all back up, they're all more resilient. Another couple of things that I heard, energy does not make money when your power goes out. They only make money on electricity that is used. That is it. So if the lights aren't working, they don't make any money, period. And as far as the repair, that is a straight pass-through. That is not a profit. That is a pass-through. Whatever the costs are, it's triple audited. That's what people pay. People have to pay, the ratepayers have to pay, but it's not a profit center. Fuel is not a profit center. They don't make money off natural gas. Thank they make you, Mr. money Bassi. off electricity. But I can't correct all the things that you just heard. That's just Thank not you. the way and, it works. And, okay. I, and I understand. What we're going to do now is, is at this time is, is we're going to allow the candidates, if they would like to do a rebuttal, if you do do a rebuttal, then you will have 60 seconds to respond to Mr. Balsier. Is there any candidate who would like to rebut? Wait, I want to rebut first. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about accountability now. I'm sorry, Mr. Balsier. We're going to allow a rebuttal, but it's for Mr. Balsier. I do apologize because we didn't mention his name, but we did say the incumbent. That so is we're going true. to allow you one yeah. opportunity to do a rebuttal for 60 seconds, okay? That's true. Thank, Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. I see the nothing in my answer, but I will say this. Um, I, I believe in a bigger debate, but I don't want them. We talk about accountability. I can't hold energy accountable if I don't hold it. But the fact of the matter is, um, I just want a reasonable, discussion of ideas and thoughts. And I like to be civilized. We all deserve that. I don't, I don't do anything to hurt people. I don't side with any utility company. They'll paint me like I'm a corrupt guy. Y'all know I've served this community for, for uh, 17 years, and you have never heard of me in corruption. I don't do like that. I'm not in the paper. You don't read about me going to jail. There are a lot of elected officials that work like that, but not me. I'm above board. I work for people. And so all that other stuff you hear, I don't know who they're talking about. I'm looking around and see what commission they're talking about. It's not me. But the fact of the matter is, I've done the work, I know the work, and I know the answers. I'm here for you. I'm not going to bring up all the particular issues, but I just ask my candidates to be reasonable and fair to the people that are paying attention. Thank you. Can I have that? Um, no, we're going to move on to the next question oh, there's, because there's of time. That's I apologize. So <laughs> and thank you very much. We're going to go ahead and start with Mr. Willie Jones for the next question. It is another long one. If you need me to repeat it, I will. Louisiana has two nuclear reactors that are nearly 40 years old. The Riverbend Nuclear, miles away from this room, I'm sorry. The Riverbend Nuclear Reactor, about three miles away from Angola, and the Waterford Three Nuclear Reactor, just 25 miles away from this room. Waterford Three is along the Mississippi, between the bayou and the lake. Considering the receding coastline, storm surges, decaying infrastructure, and what often seems like a complete lack of oversight, how confident do you feel about the safety of those nuclear facilities in the face of climate disasters? And what should we be doing to improve them? We'll go ahead and start with you, Mr. Willie Jones. Um, we're talking about safety of the people with the nuclear plants um, at hand and with the climate control, all of us is at risk with climate control, simply because of the emission, what we inhale every day, 
Um, I, I understand the river factors in more than because we was in Gramercy um, just last week, and I, I declare just driving through, the taste got in my mouth from the act from the AC plant. Um, climate control is very very important. If you don't think so, I just drove from San Antonio this just yesterday, and I saw like three fires on the side of the interstate. We have people in the Northeast that were suffering from stroke and dying from heat stroke this past summer. Hurricanes just popping up, floods popping up. All this is taking place because of the ozone and the climate control. And I think, as a public service commissioner, I will do what I can do from my position to push for renewal. Well, like I said, renewal is not going to happen overnight. The president and the Senate and the Congress just passed the bill for $369 million for some of the climate control. And with that being said, they gave 15% incentive to try to get people to change to renewal. Until we become 100% renewable, climate control is going to continue to be out here, and the safety in, of all of us is going to be at risk. So I can just do what I can do as a public service commissioner and try to force the people that we regularly to move towards renewable quicker than anything. Thank you. Thank you. Is that me? Pastor Manny, <coughs> we're right. going to go down to the right okay. just pass it down. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Um, you know, when, when it, I don't know how I can say this without mentioning a previous comment, but when it was mentioned that, uh, that the tower that fell was 70 years old, that, that hurts me because people died when that tower went down because we have more deaths because of power outages during hurricanes than any other uh, storm-related deaths. People died, and we need to be proactive instead of reactive. The word resilient can become a bad word sometimes because people just say, you're resilient, pop up, keep on going. Well, that expectation doesn't work for everybody. We just can't pop up like that and keep on going. We expect those who are in office to protect us. If that nuclear reactor is in danger of killing folks, then we need to do something about it right now. Something should have been done about it years ago when we start, saw our coastline beginning to deteriorate. And that needs to be taken care of immediately so that people don't die. Nuclear power is more expensive than solar and wind. Uh, uh, our bills are becoming more and more and uh, uh, less and less affordable. Uh, uh, high bills are causing people to be hotter than a month of July. And we need to do something about it right now and get rid of all nuclear plants and begin to move towards only solar and wind. <laughs> When I started, I talked about what is a human right. And I said that was fresh air, that is clean water, um, and, and that is, I should add, the beauty of our land. Let's be very clear. Nuclear is not a renewable energy that we should be using. Um, nuclear offers many damages. Um, we can look towards our friends in Nevada at Yucca Mountain and see what the nuclear waste has done in the rural portions of Nevada and, and, and hurt their economy and hurt their health. Um, so we have to be very clear that we need to move away from nuclear. Nuclear, I, as I said, I, I do not support nuclear because it has been proven time and time again in every study that it produces uh, disruptive health outcomes. Um, when the waste is near water, uh, it, it can destroy our water and give us uh, situations as we've seen in Nevada where their water supply dis disappears. Um, and it is challenging because it is not building a more sustainable future for our state. Uh, so what should we do? I think we need to move to shutting down uh, those nuclear plants. I don't think they are um, the investments we should be making. And, and, and I just I can't let a, a comment go about, well, everything costs money. Well, that's exactly what the rich and powerful always say. I can't give you what you deserve or what you need because it costs me too much money. And the question that we have to ask ourselves, will we finally start centering the people of our state over the corporations that dictate when, what, and how things are given to us? That is the challenge we are faced with, and that is why we must end nuclear, and that is why we also must make the investments. Because when we invest in people, we know our society improves, lives improve. 
But I'm not going to sit there and be lectured about telling you fraudulent things because I'm not being an energy executive and giving you their talking points. We can make change in this country, and we know we have the resources. This is not a question about whether or not Louisiana they has the resources to do what is right. It's whether our leaders have the willpower to hold those people accountable to do what is right, and whether or not we do what is right ourselves. And that's what I will do as a public service commissioner. I think the question was about the power of safety. But anyway, the, uh, the, question the, about the, question. the um, I think the question about safety, uh, weather conditions and safety, like I, I totally agree that um, when the storms are on its way with the nature of the question, uh, there is a, a weather lockdown of the nuclear power plants and it's something we all worry about. Because like I mentioned in the previous question, storms are coming and even the power plants, the nuclear power plants are subject to being affected. Now they, they're built much stronger than most other power plants with tons of concrete and they're relatively safe. Uh, nobody's building nuclear in Louisiana. Those plants are old as well, but nuclear, for all it works, I, I don't know, um, I'm, I don't mean to lecture you, but things cost money, and things that you want people to do are clearly just going to raise bills. For example, the, some of the cheapest power in Louisiana is nuclear power. It helps bring the prices down. It was built 50 years ago too, but, it's still, it, but when it's operating, it's working great in lowering our costs, not raising our costs. We don't have any particular damage here. Now, I don't think we'll ever build another nuclear plant here, but they're already here, and when they get retired, and they're, they're set to be retired soon, we won't, probably won't build any more ever. And I totally agree that we need to move to more solar, to more wind. And when my opponents talk about accountability, I'll give you one, how much I have I'll give you one uh, example. This is just this summer, in July, after Ida last year, after we saw um, not enough investment in solar, after we saw energy making profits, and after we saw how they spend their profits. Now, energy is, a, is more than just energy power company that we see. Energy is a corporation that, that has the components that we do not regulate. We dragged the CEO of Energy before the Public Service Commission to make him answer all these questions you have tonight. It's online. Myself, Foster Campbell, and mostly myself and Foster Campbell, grilled this man on his actions and the company's actions and why we thought they were being irresponsible to the people of Louisiana but not investing in renewable energy and for not making the necessary repairs on the storm. And they won't get recovery from that. They will not get any money for that. And I'll tell you something else. After that meeting, that man is no longer CEO of energy. He's gone. That's called a coding people accountable. That's what I've done, that's what I'll continue to do. And everything I said, is, is, you can look it up and it's online at the Public Service Commission, all our meetings are public. Thank you, gentlemen, for that. And we'll move on to the next question. Okay, we have looked on the Public Service Commission website for the ways in which commissioners vote on various issues, yet we could not find anything. Could any of you direct us to where the public service commissioner's voting record exists? Mr. Sure. Bossier? I guess that's just for me. <laughs> I know I'm voting records, record, so I've never looked it up. I have no idea. No, but I'm sure if you call the commission, everything we have is a public record. There's no secret, there's nothing to hide. I don't know if it's on the website. It might be, it might not be. Um, but I'm sure if you call the commission, we have a record of everything we do. The other thing we do, all of our meetings are live, live streamed. All of our meetings are, people can come, and we often have tons of people show up and sit there through our meetings. The, 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 all the newspapers report on our voting and the things that we do, but the commission has a voting record of us. Every, every word that is said in our meetings is recorded by a court reporter, and all of our meetings are not only videotaped live and, and aired, but they're also posted on, on the web, on YouTube, so you can go back and check everything. And then I'm sure if you ask for a transcript, uh, maybe you have to call it in. I mean, a website can only do so much, and I'm sure they'll be more than happy to give you a whole history of what you want. It is not a secret. Nobody wants it. I want my record to be seen. I'll get it for you. <clears throat> I'll tell you right now. I, I really should share with it. So all the things they're saying, I've already done anyway. But, it, uh, but, but I'll be more than happy to share it with you. But it's a great question. I'll ask the IT people at the commission to see if they can make it available. But I've never gone on the website because I know, I know my own voting right. 
I would say the Louisiana Public Service Commission website is one of the hardest to navigate in our state government. When you look at the Louisiana legislative website that many of you have probably gone on to, you can click a date, you can click all the committee hearings, and you can see the vote totals. Um, and so I think one of the things we have to do if elected as a commission is make sure that the information is accessible to everyone. Um, that you don't have to dig through the website to find an agenda, that you don't have to um, know the special link to get the live stream, but that your voting record um, is clear as we see in the legislative website. But if uh, we can't get the commission um, as an entity, as a governmental entity to do it, then that we should do it. Um, I, I strongly believe um, that uh, elected officials should keep their own voting record and push them out. And one of the things that I've committed is every vote that I would take, that I would publish it in a, in a Excel, Excel spreadsheet or document form that, ex that says what I voted for and why I voted for it or why I voted against it. Because I believe in that transparency. And I think transparency is not just about what the entity it does itself, but what you do yourself. Because a lot of times we don't need um, the, 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 the the bureaucrats and the staff to do it, I can do it, right? And so that is my commitment um, to ensuring that in the future those voting records are more visible. Um, but also as a commission, I would push to make sure that website is more accessible because I do think it is very hard to navigate. It, is a, it, it looks a little old um, and it can be a lot more user friendly um, and accessible, uh, not only to people finding information, but to various people with different disabilities um, as well, which I think is a struggle in sometimes our state government. Thank you. Mr. Jones, would you like to answer the question in terms of, is, of accessibility? Yes. I mean, uh, any government agent or state agent, uh, you know, you can actually just request a, do a public um, record request. But I have navigated through Public Service Commissioner, um, and I, didn't, I can't say I found the voting record, but I found the transcript in the form of a document. You know, they just don't put it like this This commission voted this way, this commission voted that way. They have it in a whole trans, um, transcript form of a document. So it, it, you could find it, but you're going to have to work your way through to find it. But my thing is to you, uh, to anyone, it's easy to always do a public um, record request. Um, because the Public Service Commission actually have a whole complete law staff that work along with them. You know, so it's just not the public service commission. There's a whole law staff, and it's lawyers that work under the law staff. You got executive counsel, you got secretary, and then you have law staff that work under. So I don't think you can just call any one of the the, the the law division and get what you need from it. But I do think it needs a little twerking to make it easy. Thank you. Mr. Manning. Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. Look, I just want to make it clear that we're not up here as wonderful, handsome black men to attack you, <laughs> any of us. Uh, this is all about can we do it better in this next season, in this next era. Not that anyone has done anything wrong. Maybe they've tried their best. In the next six years, uh, as opposed to the last 18, can we do better? Now listen, one of the things that we need to work on is being absolutely transparent, making sure information is available, and the fact is that so many of us here knew nothing about the PSC. Don't know who your commissioner is. Don't know what District 3, what parishes it consists of. That should not be the case. The Public Service Commission holds so much power and authority to do some amazing things that's going to make each of our lives better during the next six years. And so what we need is for each of us here to be involved in the process. There should be public service announcements about the PSC that say, come on in, come on in to the meetings, come on into my office, here are my office hours, and don't wait for the public service commissioner to come to you, to you for, for, wait for the, for the public service commissioner should not be waiting for you to come to them. They should come to you, into your community, meeting you, hosting town halls with you. That creates transparency that you're talking about, along with making the website more accessible for full transparency. All right, thank you, gentlemen, for those responses. We're going to move on to our next question, which is the Lindsay one as well. The Public Service Commission has the authority to cap rates on phone calls, including calls in prisons and jails. However, the contracts are, con are crafted by phone companies and wardens and the consumer being preyed upon in these monopolies. Meanwhile, phone calls are the number one 
way for families to stay in touch. For those blessed enough to have one, they are the top tool for re rehabilitation and reentry. And barriers to this communication are the leading causes of violence in jails and prisons. Do you believe charging $17.20 an hour to use the phone with profit splits between securers and shares is appropriate? Why or why not? Let's go ahead and start with you, Mr. Willie Jones, and pass to the right, please. Sorry. Thank you, thank you. That's a very um, sensitive and touching question. No, I don't believe it's important. Um, appropriate um, because I, I, I truly believe when someone is incarcerated, it's just not that person that's incarcerated that is incarcerated. It's the mother, it's the grandmother, it's the husband, it's the wife, it's the sister. These people suffer just like the person inside the jail suffer. So these people need to talk to their person that's incarcerated just as bad as that person needs to talk to the person on the outside. So it's outrageous and it's inappropriate and I can sit here today and I will pledge that I will never ever vote to increase those phone calls and I will fight to keep a cap or put a cap on those phone calls. That is my commitment to voters, that is my commitment to the people that's incarcerated, that is my commitment to the family that have incarcerated individual. Thank you. That me? Yes. All right, thank Pass you. Pass down to the right. That's, that's right. Thank you. Thank you. That's $17.20 is absolutely obscene, unconscionable, and absolutely ridiculous. Uh, and we've got to understand that $17.20 can get you a loaf of bread and some eggs and maybe some bologna at the grocery store. But it, 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 and, and so we got to, my goal is to make sure people in the state of Louisiana keep more money in their pockets and in their wallets so that they can be able to provide for their families. And let's be honest, the more money that entities like telecommunications and those companies that are charging folks take from the people, the more we're going to see crime uh, continue to rise. We've got to find root causes. And the more you keep families isolated from the incarcerated loved ones, and when you keep little Johnny not being able to talk to his daddy and get counsel from him, that's continually to continuing to call the demise of our family units. Let me say this too, there's no reason sheriffs and, and get their sheriffs negotiate on those uh, phone services and how much percentage they're going to get back from those phone companies. That should never be the case. So uh, the jail in, in, in Orleans gets, it has a budget of $78,000, I believe. No, that sounds too low. Uh, I'll take that back. Uh, but, but they get 1% of their budget comes from that negotiation. Let's figure out some other way to get that money to the sheriffs rather than them having to negotiate with those phone companies. Let's get those phone charges as low as possible because fam if families and incarcerated loved ones need to have that support system so that we can prevent recidivism and make sure that our incarcerated have good mental health and that comes by be being able to talk to their loved ones at a low, low rate. I strongly believe in math, and so I want to talk about a little bit of math really quickly. The federal poverty line in, in our country is a median income household of $26,000. A individual who is incarcerated has a median income of $20,000 before they are incarcerated which means if you think about a phone call, that means their average income a day is about $50, which means for a 15-minute phone call, they are going to spend over half of their income in making a connection with their family member. I strongly believe human interaction is a human right, and we should not be restricting that, uh, because what we know is that recidivism decreases. The studies have shown uh, that individuals that were able to contact their family at least three times, 70% of them never returned to being incarcerated. So we have to end what is called the kickback calls that we've seen across this nation, 
where telecommunication companies and prisons and wardens are making the deals and regulations of what that, that rate should be. Um, as a commissioner, I would be strongly advocating for justice and human rights and ensuring that we lower them. I believe we should move in the model of Connecticut, which has made all incarcerated phone calls free. But if we can't do like Connecticut because it is too expensive, uh, as some may say, then let's do the path that Massachusetts has done, which means the first 30 minutes is free. We can make change, and I believe that this is outrageous, um, and we need to end the, call, the, the kickback clause, and we need to lower the rates, and I think it is time for us to regulate more sternly um, telecommunication companies and making sure that we are not making money or having people profit off of what should be a human right, which is human connection with their family. This is a matter I take very seriously. Now, this is one of many issues you hear where we all agree on the same thing. Uh, this is clearly one, just like renewable energy and everything else, we don't agree on the same thing. I completely agree that the rates are too high. But they used to be higher before I got on the commission. Because I'm the one who reduced them down to this, even though they're still too high. I was not satisfied with this rate, but this is the lowest that they would reduce the rates. I'm the one who stepped the cap. It was way more than this. I don't even know what the rates were because they were all over the place. Each one was individual. So we brought it to this far, and I'm still not satisfied. I will tell you what, you're right. It, it, is, it, it, it changes the community. When people are removed from the community and they're removed from their families, whether they're incarcerated or not, we have to make sure there's a human connection to the people that are incarcerated and the families on the outside. And I support that. In my motion before the commission when I did it, I'll, I'll give you an example. I moved that immediate family had a free call, had free calls. Clergy, pastors and ministers got free calls. A little law clinic got free calls. Uh, agencies like a little law clinic. Uh, the the uh, incarcerated or, or, or residents attorneys got free calls and other agencies like Southern Poverty Law Center and Bail Bond all can get free calls. Some calls outside of that may have a charge. And this was over 10 years ago when we did this, or just about 10 years ago. Uh, not all of it was able to pass, but this is what was in my bill and that's on the record. And the final thing I want to mention about that, I recently met with one of our sheriffs. I don't want to name names because I don't want to bring other people's business here. I'll talk about my business. And we are trying to work, and I gave my commitment to this sheriff, oh, I'm gonna say the gender, I don't want to say the gender. I gave my commitment to this sheriff that we're going to work for a zero cost um, uh, uh, telecommunications. And not just telephone, we're looking at video calls where everybody can get a tablet of their own to communicate with their family. So, yes, I agree. And I agree with my fellow opponents, like most things we're going to talk about tonight. We agree on. We're not as different as you might be. The fact is, we all believe in helping people. And I, I've done the work, I've made the votes, it's not as though as I'd like it to be, and I know we can do better, we will. We just have to get more change, and we're getting it done at the commission right now. Thank you for your responses. Okay, next question. And let me know if you need me to repeat it. Energy is prohibited from contributing to campaigns for city council while anyone with a significant interest in the gambling industry is prohibited from donating to all political candidates. What do you think is the purpose for such rules, and why do you believe there are no prohibitions regarding the Public Service Commission? Mr. Lewis, can you please answer first? Absolutely. I think the purpose of these rules is impropriety. Uh, to showcase a level of degree of separation from the entities that you are regulating. I mean, it's very hard as we talked about um, if the Gaming Commission accepted donations uh, from casinos, how can you strongly regulate them? Uh, I strongly believe in a, a prohibition on these entities, and this would require work with the, the, the Louisiana legislature. I mean, they would have to pass that law because uh, the Public Service Commission doesn't have that authority. But even though the Public Service Commission doesn't have that authority, as a human being and as an elected official or as a person, I have authority over who donates to my campaign. I uh, have the authority of declining donations, and that's why I have said um, if we can't get the state government to do it, I'll do it myself. Because to do what is right does not require a state law. To do what is 
right does not require someone else to force me to do it. I can make that choice personally, and I should stand on it if I truly believe in it. Um, and so I think what we have to do is we need to be working with our legislative delegation to ensure we make stronger ethic rules for uh, the Louisiana Public Service Commission. Then I believe as candidates and as elected officials, we should hold ourselves to a higher standard. Uh, we should go above and beyond the law to showcase that we are above reproach and we're not being bought and paid for, or we're not getting a side deal. And sometimes it's not even about being corrupt. It could simply mean that it's just access. Money equals access at times, which means if you give me money, I may answer your phone call first because you donated to my campaign. And so that is why I strongly believe in the degree of separation. But as I said, it requires a state law, but it doesn't need a state law. It requires a personal commitment, which is what you'll get from me. Thank you. Mr. Jones, would you like to answer next? Yes, I will. And I, I normally don't agree with my opponents, but I do agree with Mr. Devante. Um, it does show separation. And actually, it truly it just show honesty. I mean, uh, if I'm not taking money from you, you don't feel the will to have access to me. So I feel like the Public Service Commission, who they regulate, they shouldn't be able to take money from the company they regulate. Now, if I win this position, that will be on me to accept money, if I choose to accept money. But I, you have to draw the line. You can accept it with an explanation, or you cannot accept it. But just like you said about the game, the game commission, and I think it's the same thing with the, um, with the fairground and the racetrack commission. They can't, they can't donate money to these, these, these entities. So it's very wrong to accept money from people you regulate. Because it does send a bad message to people you regulate. I mean, you might give me money in a closed meeting room, and you have something coming before us that I need to vote on, and, it, and you be expecting my vote, and I stand for voting, and you upset thinking just because you gave me money and donated to my campaign, that that was a way of saying, hey, it's, everything is good with what's coming before we know. So I don't agree with it. That's fine, Mr. Mayor. Yes, you can answer. Mike? Yes. It, the old, old phrase that says, he who pays the piper calls the tune. Some will tell you that it's not illegal to accept those campaign contributions and other contributions and whatever. Um, and it's not illegal, but that doesn't make it right. To me, it is morally wrong for any uh, commissioner to accept campaign contributions from any entity that is supposed to regulate. That is why uh, uh, last year, my organization that I founded and sit as chairman of the Greater New Orleans Interfaith Climate Coalition sent a recommendation to the Ethics Review Board that it be reviewed, that those campaign contributions be reviewed, and then they sent a recommendation to New Orleans City Council. It passed unanimously so that they passed an ordinance that made it illegal for any candidate for New Orleans City Council to receive campaign contributions. That is on the book, and that is what also should be on the books for uh, the Public Service Commission as well too. Now it can be done through the legislature, but I also believe that it can be done by making a, a, a simple resolution between the PSC members as well too. I don't like hearing folks say it can't be done. Let's figure out a way that it can be done for the sake of the people. I was asked by uh, one of my opponents one time, uh, who gives me money for my campaign? Listen, I've got about 140 contributors. All of them are grassroots po folks. Uh, an elderly woman put $20 in my hand, and I work for that elderly widow who put $20 in my hand. I don't work for Entergy, will never work for Entergy. I work for the people of the state of Louisiana. I will work for the people of the state of Louisiana as commissioner, and the people need to know that, that they have an accountable person sitting in that seat who is a man of integrity that will not be compromised by anyone that's slipping the money under the table or over the table, who already has a lot of power. Entergy has executives and lobbyists and lawyers, but the people don't have those lobbyists. You don't have a lawyer, and so you need somebody who's unencumbered, not aligned in any way, shape, or form with the entity that they're supposed to regulate. And that's the commissioner that I will be for you as I keep my pledge not to take any campaign contributions. I've done it before. I've made sure the Thank New Orleans City Council can't do it. I'll do it again. Thank you. 
So it's easy to say you're not going to take money from people that's not giving you money anyway. But let me tell you, um, let me tell you, the, 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 the truth of the matter is, these are campaign donations, and it is the law. It's legal. It is the only way campaigns can be financed. The, I, I receive tons of money from family and friends and little donations and many, many things and volunteers, like, like everyone else. But we also receive money in our campaigns from the legal proper process. It's legal, moral, and ethical. And let me ask, if you don't mind, and with, with, along the rules, I'm going to ask Willie a question. Willie, will you accept campaign contributions from, from any of the entities that we're talking about right now? I don't know. I, like I said earlier, I, so, so, I, I'm so, not in that position to say. I, if I accept it, it's me being honest that I can separate myself from making a decision or accepting money. Just because you're giving me money don't mean you find my way to rule or vote on an issue that's before me. So it's, 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 it's about you being honest with you. Right, and yeah. I, I agree with you, Willie. It's about being honest. Now, I just told you all the work I did on behalf of prisoners. You think a prisoner gave me a donation? Absolutely not. I do that for people. I work for the public. There are five of us. And myself and Foster Campbell walked, and nobody's calling anybody corrupt. I haven't violated one rule of corruption since I've been on the commission at all. And I do not vote on behalf of utility companies. And, and you cherry pick some of those questions. You use gambling and, and, and some, some other entity. But what about all the contractors that give to the mayors and legislators? There's no other way to finance a campaign. Now, look, I don't, I'm not defending it. It's just, it's just the rules. And if I took a pledge, and they did, what would happen then? You get beat every time because you couldn't raise any money. The fact is, you can self-regulate, but you can't regulate your opponents. And so if it's legal, other people will also raise the money. I know it's a complex question. We've, we've debated a long time. And I also see it in other forums. If the state changed the rule, I would be thrilled and I wouldn't, I would follow it. Just like I follow every other law and rule. And so I just think it's a fair way to go. And if you went to any other process, then the government would have to finance campaigns. And we know that just won't happen. Thank you. All right, thank you for your time, gentlemen. And one last one for you. Have you or do you plan to accept campaign contributions from any of the entities that have a financial interest in the PSC regulations. Why or why not? We're gonna go ahead and start with you, Mr. Bossier, and go to our Good question. I can follow up where I was, I was getting off the top. When you look at it that, first of all, you have to accept the premise of corruption. That's what they're trying to lay the ground for. First of all, it's a premise of corruption. I'm here to tell you there's absolutely zero premise of corruption. There's ethics review and there's moral reviews. And the decision to do so is outside of the authority of the Public Service Commission. It is state law, okay? And I hear all the reasons that, they, of course, it's easy to pick on a candidate. These are not my rules. These are the state's rules. Now, um, there are some rules that are my rules. There are some rules that are the Public Service Commission rules. And we do have an ethics rules that we govern our own ethics. Not campaign finance, but every other form of ethics we cover ourselves and set up our own rules. Uh, once, again, once I received the commission, there were other things that people did to get access. There were whining and dining commissioners. Initial commissioners were going to dinner and lunch and taking trips with utility companies and other people. I put a stop to everything within my power to stop. I passed a rule where commissioners cannot do that anymore. Okay? The one thing about campaign finance, it's transparent and clear. Um, in addition to that, if you think about it, um, like I said, judges accept campaign contributions from attorneys. You have to understand how the commission works. It is not the legislature. It is set up on the basis of cases. You have opponents on each side. There is complete fairness. If you limit one person from being able to donate, then you are saying that you are corrupt for the other people. What my opponents won't tell you is they're going to receive money from other people. They have already established the corruption. So whoever gives them money has their access. I will never agree to that. Everyone has my access. They have already set the premise. If you get money, you get their access. That's not the way I operate. I give people access. And that's the way I function from the beginning. That's the way I function, I continue to function. And I, and I hope the legislature, and I hope the federal government, because the federal government does it too. I wish they would change the rule. That would make it easier. I don't, I don't you know, we have to follow the law. And that is the law. So I feel like I'm in compliance. I know how it sounds, but it's more complicated than that. But I've always, I'll let nobody give me the moniker that I work for anybody who gives me, who's donated to campaign companies. I work for a public, and my, my public will know that too. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Mr. Lewis? 
simply answering the question I won't because I don't believe in the status quo. For too long, rich, powerful corporations and companies and people have paid and bought off our elected officials. And I'm not going to sit there and disagree that because that's the system, that's the way it should be. I did not mention your name. I did not mention your name. I'm giving my statement. I still want to interrupt because a donation is not a payoff. That is a bribe he's talking about. That is not the question. He's talking about a payoff and a bribe, which is illegal, not legal. That's not what I said. I know the difference between legal. Mr. Bossier, I know the difference between legal. I mean, what'd you say? I said bought and paid off. I believe. Okay, that's what you just said. On it's not a bribe. I didn't say it was a bribe. Time, I, but I got to hold people accountable. Let's start right here. Right. I mean, I think he should hold himself accountable and stop taking 80% of his donations from the corporations that he's regulating, like Intergy. So if we want to talk about accountability, we can go there, Mr. Bossier. But to answer and to continue my question um, that I was stating is that our campaign finance system has been broken in this country for too long. And what we need to do is we need to say, let's change the system. We don't need state law. And yes, it's legal. I've never said it's not legal. I said I don't find it moral. I find it to be somebody being bought and paid off, whether that is the legal definition or not. Because what I do is I stand on my values and my principles every step of the way. And I'm not going to let the rich and powerful dictate how I do it. If I lose this campaign if because I don't accept donations from Entergy and those companies, I will live happy. Because what I am in this race for is making sure that the people of Louisiana has an independent fighter, someone who is holding the establishment accountable because for too long they have held a grip on our state. When we talk about our power grid being unreliable, it's because they have had a, grip, a, a power grip on our state. When we talk about the lack of investments in criminal justice, it's because the sheriffs have had a grip on our state. And I'm not going to defend the system that has given them power for too long. I strongly believe that if we want a government for the people, we need to let, let people have that power and campaign donations and the way our system has worked is wrong and I will never, ever agree to it and I've never agreed to it. And that is why I will not accept donations because I strongly believe people should come first. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Um, we're almost finished, so we're going to try to maintain and keep the answers for the questions so that we can move on. We're almost done. Pastor Manning, you want to go ahead? The, and answer the answer to the question is absolutely, unequivocally, no. Let me make this very clear. We have a uh, litigation going on between Grand Gulf Nuclear Plant uh, 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 trying to get a settlement between them that could ultimately come back to you all ratepayers. And that settlement is going on right now. And do you know that on February 14th, Entergy executives gave my dear friend at the end of the table a wonderful Valentine gift where they gave five executives, gave him five donations. Who does that help? Does that help him make a decision that's going to benefit us as people or a decision that's going to benefit Entergy? I wonder why they would give that Valentine's Day gift on February the 14th. Also, too, he says, listen, and, and, and I may call a name, but listen, uh, he says, well, I, I don't work for the incarcerated. But do you know also that part of his campaign contributions are from Cox and AT&T? Go look at the record. Also know this, that at the end of the day, we have to make sure that people are taken care of. Right now, people are hurting, and they're also dying because of our utility service. I am proud to say I work for the widow who put $20 in my hand. 80 years old. I will never say I work for Entergy or anyone else, and we need to make sure that we are above board in everything that we do. I will never accept not one dollar from Entergy, Cox, or AT&T. I give you my word. I may not have fancy commercials that are coming out. I may not have brilliant billboards, but I won't say that I can't do it without Entergy money. I can. It may not look as fabulous, but I am going to do it, and I will take that seat and keep my pledge to you not to take any energy money ever because it doesn't help us as people who are poor and who are hurting right now. Listen, I see, I, it's kind of heated in here, but. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I never saw Mr. Devante got as heated, but Mr. Devante got his belief. How's the man that got his belief? And Commissioner Bossier got his belief, and Willie Jones have his belief. I was always raised by my parents 
to be honest, to make clear decisions, to always be part of the people and part of people. Just because I accept money from somebody that I regularly doesn't mean that person control me, doesn't mean that company control me, doesn't mean I'm gonna sell my people out. Because I'm from a neighborhood where you can't sell your people out. I'm from a community where if you sell your people out, you may not make it back home. <laughs> so I understand that. So I'm not, I'm not from the sell out part of the world. But you got to be able to justify. You got to be able to just make a clear decision. Just because someone gives me money don't mean I'm corrupt and they're going to control me. It's you. It's your heart. It's your morals. It's your value that make the decision for you. If you got morals and you got values, you can get money from Joe Biden and still vote against him. But it's your morals. It's your character. It's your value that that control you through life. And that's where I stand on that issue. Thank you for your responses. Okay, next question. Next question is, it's one of my favorites, what professional experience do you have in your career that you believe will best contribute to your work as PSC commissioner and why? And we'll begin with Pastor Manning. I can't get past the title of Pastor Manning. Uh, that's who I am. And pastors are uh, champions for serving the people. My whole life has been about serving the people and those who are hurting. I stand by the hurting. I, I stand up for the little Davids that are always fighting the lions. I stand for those that have been pushed aside and marginalized. And I make sure, listen, that the name above, the banner above my church says, no perfect people allowed. And every day I live by that to say, look, we may not be perfect, but we're going to try to do it better on the next day. And that means that I have an open door policy. I believe that your public service commissioner should, should say, I have no favoritism, no partiality, that everybody is welcomed in, and that, that you can reach me at any time, morning, noon, and night. Uh, you can come into my office at any time. You can expect that when you call me, I will return your call. If you need me, I will show up. If you need me to go to bat for you, then I will do that. Uh, and I'm a community activist and an organizer. I am an agent of change, and I've significantly shown that in various ways as I slept in Duncan Park advocating for the homeless, as I've gone to jail in Baton Rouge, as I've protested for those in Cancer Alley, as I've stood for those uh, who, who protested against uh, City Hall being moved to Congo Square. I'm a change agent and my record has shown that change can happen and must happen and will happen if we stand tall and make sure that we proclaim our voice and insist that it happens. Thank you very much, Pastor Manna. We, we only have a few, one more um, question to go. We have a couple of more questions to go, so I want to just remind everyone, all our attendees and candidates, just to hang in there, hang tight. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on with the same question to Mr. Jones. Could you repeat the question? Sure. What professional experience do you have in your career that you believe will best contribute to your work as PSC commissioner, and why? Great. I've reigned over um, 16 years to, as a professional, as a business owner, a small business owner. I had to make tough decisions. I had to make easy decisions. Um, social and human service, I worked in it. Um, developing project management, I worked in it. It's just, this job is not rocket science. Back to what I said earlier, you don't need a PhD to, to sit on a PSC. That's a wrap, that's a rhyme. Huh? You don't need a PhD to sit on a PSC. <laughs> so, that's even with that being said, it goes back to your character. You being honest, you making the decisions for the business you represent and the people you represent. And that's what I would always do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Yes, I, I think I bring a, 
a host of experience that would be beneficial. I started off as a community organizer, someone being in our community as a student, making sure that people were part of the process. I often say that our system needs to be more about building power for people and less about the people in power. Uh, but I've also been a policy uh, advocate and researcher. Uh, I, I worked hand in hand with Step Up Louisiana when we were doing Unleash Local, looking at preemption. Uh, I have worked tirelessly um, in the Louisiana legislature, drafting policies and fighting for our people. This session, when it came towards predatory lending, when payday lenders wanted to expand, wanted to expand their practices in the state of Louisiana, I was the frontline person fighting against them and convinced Governor John Bell Edwards to veto that bill. When it came to fair and equitable maps, not only did I testify uh, at the Louisiana legislature, when they passed a racist, unconstitutional map, I didn't just sit idly by, I am a plaintiff in the lawsuit challenging the state of Louisiana. I've been on the front lines of fighting for economic justice, racial justice, and public policy. So I bring the experience of knowing how policy works and how policy is intersectional, that we have to talk about poverty when we talk about environment, that we have to talk about poverty when we talk about telecommunications. I and mean, so that experience of knowing how to do that is beneficial, but I'm also a coalition builder. I have not just worked with my progressive and liberals in the state legislature, I've worked with Republicans. I passed one of the strongest student loan reform bills in the nation with Julie Emerson, a radical conservative, and she would love that I said that, from Karen Crow, Louisiana, that is the Republican caucus's policy chair. So I am unwavering in my principles, but I'm not uncompromisable in my work. And my history and my career has shown that from every step of the way, that I am a leader uh, in doing the work of the people because I strongly believe that we have to center people in policy making. Yes, I'm ready for you okay. to start. I just want to make sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, first of all, the question was experience. Uh, uh, what makes this um, suitable for the job? Look, I, I have the, not only the experience of doing the job, but I have a very, very diverse and um, uh, sound education. My education is business, law. And you're right, you don't have to have a PhD to take the business. Really? But I, but I tell you what, you, you better have some, uh, you better understand business, you better understand law, and you better understand policy. You better be able to navigate not only the legislature, but the city council and Congress. You better, you better be able to walk and talk in every room possible, and you better know what you're talking about. Now, I have all that background. In addition to that, the work experience that I had at the Public Service Commission alone, I fought, and my record is clear. Remember, I'll get you the record if you can't find it on the internet, I promise you. Uh, I fought for renewable energy, that's a fact. I fought for poor people, that's a fact. A, a, a fact that I can prove. I fought for lower rates, that's a fact. I fight for lower prison funds, that's a fact, and I continue to. I continue to help people at every stage in my career. In addition to that, this is not my first time being elected. I was elected prior to this. And so the strongest background I have is my service to the public. Public Service Commission, I have served the public. My entire career, I have spent helping people over and over again, and that I'm most proud of. I'm also very proud of my, uh, as Mr. Jones said, my morals and my ethics. I'm not, I'm not the guy that they, they're trying to paint me like. And if I were, I wouldn't be here right now. I won a war to my integrity. I won the, champ the Consumer Champion Award from the Alliance for Affordable Energy because of the work I did for poor people and people who are less fortunate. They don't give that to corrupt people. I promise you, I have the experience, the background, and the, and the constitution of my own character. And my opponents really know this. They don't want to tell you that they run against me. But they, they know the kind of person that I am. And they know I don't lie. And they know I don't cheat. They know I'm a good person. Thank um, you. And, and so. Thank you, Mr. Bouchier. We all. have one final question. And, and actually, this question is for you, um, along with the other panel members, as they see fit to answer. Commissioner Bossier, over the past 17 years, you have raised tens of thousands for your election campaigns, nearly all of it from entities, entities such as AT&T, Cox, 
and other various telecommunications and utility providers. Meanwhile, your campaign filings indicate that the bulk of your expenses are for restaurants and hotels with no traditional campaign expenditures, such as a campaign manager. Some will look at this and believe we need major campaign finance reform in Louisiana, such as publicly funded campaigns. Would you like to comment on this? Yeah, public funding campaigns would be great. Fine with me. We can do that. Yeah. Uh, let, let me say something. I haven't had a campaign. I, 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 I don't have those expenses because I don't have a campaign. I've never had. I haven't had a campaign in years. I've been I've been reelected by being unopposed. So I'm not surprised. I, I mean, that's interesting to look at and listen to. But I haven't I haven't had to spend any money on that. And I also haven't had many fun. I've had very 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 few fundraisers. If you want to look at my practices, I don't know. I haven't had a campaign. I haven't had races uh, because generally I've been pretty much accepted by the public and, 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 and my race. So, uh, do we want to go to public financing? Sure, uh, that would be fine with me. If you can get it passed, I'll, be, I'll, I'll, I'll champion it with you. And whoever else wants to do it, I got no problem with that. Perfectly fine. That's fine, Mr. Lewis. Would you like to comment? I think the only comment I'll, I'll make is, is I'm, I'm not going to accept those type of campaign donations. Mine is uh, grassroots based off of the people um, who uh, believe in the issues that I care about and believe uh, in the things that we should do. I strongly believe uh, in public financing of campaigns. I think we need stronger campaign finance laws um, in general in Louisiana. Um, uh, and, and I was one of the people stopping the expansion that we saw of campaign uh, contribution limits uh, about two years ago. Um, but I think when we, th th this question gets to the heart of what electoral politics means. Democracy is and shouldn't be for sale. And, and when we think about that concept, typically the way that we have allowed campaigns to be funded and run in this country uh, means the more connected you are to the rich and the powerful, uh, the more likely you are to get donations and the more likely you are to succeed. That is not the America that I believe in. That is not the Louisiana that I believe in. It is going to be very difficult. I am not naive to the fact um, that it is a challenge, but I believe it takes making those cracks in that glass ceiling of ensuring that people are electing their individuals, not the entities and the corporations and the rich and the powerful picking who they choose to keep uh, in power to not hold them accountable. Um, and so that is the quest. That is what I've been doing uh, all my life and I will continue to do it. And so we will run this campaign with the donations that uh, we get um, and we will, we will see what we can do. But I strongly believe that we must and can do better and we must stop accepting the status quo as the only option for our future. We can build a more prosperous future if we choose to do so. The moment I decided to run and I qualified, I put out a video uh, issuing a pledge to all candidates to make this a race with no strings attached. And that meant my uh, making sure that all of us took the pledge who would to make sure that we did not take any campaign contributions from any entity that we regulated. Uh, my friend, Devontae Lewis, accepted that pledge. And no one else did. But, but listen, uh, I believe in change right here and now. I am so glad that the commissioner said that he's open to that. Um, and, and, and so I issued him the same pledge. It, we, can, we, can, we can start right here and say that we will not do that. And so I asked the commissioner, will you accept the pledge today to not take any campaign contributions from any entities that we regulate? so that we can make this a fair race. I, I make the pledge to the people, not to my fellow candidate. Now, the, I, what is the pledge? I, I, well, I'm not going to respond to your pledge, because I think it's a short-sighted question. I really do. Well, I, I, well, I, well, I, I, I just, I, wait, wait, if you drag me into it, then we have to talk about well, it. Well, I'll give you, I maybe they'll give you a chance. I want to just try I mean, to get, no, a, get a straight answer. answer. But, but here, here, here's answer. what I want you to know, is that I've gotten over 100 contributions from, from, from people who are just like you, uh, just like me, um, people who don't have a lot of money, two paychecks away from being homeless, uh, and I call every single one of them. Uh, if you want to hear my voice, make a pledge at manicforjames.com, and I will call and thank you wholeheartedly for getting on, uh, joining the movement that says that we want to put 
people above uh, private interest groups and shareholders and people who only want to make a profit. It's time for that. You deserve someone sitting in that chair who works solely for you and you can trust that. That's why I made that pledge and that's why I'll keep it. It's not the Italy. I'm not calling him corrupt. He's a good guy. He's a good man. He hasn't done anything wrong. And, 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 but I believe now is the time that we put someone in office that's going to run for you and totally work for you and not drag their feet and not show any uh, uh, semblance of being uh, uh, compromised in any way, shape, or form. You deserve that. I believe you deserve that. So uh, let's not get it twisted. We're all good guys. and We're all uh, rooting for, for the state of Louisiana so that we don't lose anymore. We're going to come up. We got six years to do it, and we're going to do it. I purely believe it. Let's turn her hurtfulness into hopefulness. I guess I need to get on Pastor Manning bandwagon because I haven't received a hundred donations. You need to tell me how to do it. <laughs> I'm going to spend my money here. <laughs> so, uh, Got some good volunteers. I <laughs> when it comes down to money being raised, hey, I need to get with you. But not only the campaign finances need to be reformed, this whole campaign system from water fine to the active fine to the attorney general's office holding you accountable but not holding you accountable. This whole process needs to be reformed. It will need to go back to the mayor. The mayor qualified with active funds. When you qualify with active funds, you violate because you sign a sworn affidavit saying you owe no taxes and you owe no fines. Now, one time does it say you can go back and requalify, but some people was able to do it, some people not able to do it. I remember I had an active plan that surpassed like a year or two. The next thing I know, I get a letter from the Attorney General saying they, they took my income tax for $218. But then you look on, on the list and you see people who owe active fine from, from 2016 to 22, but then they give them an opportunity to qualify and then go back and re-qualify after paying the fine. So not just the campaign finance, this whole thing needs to be found. Because you know what it goes back to? What's good for the goose is good for the gang. And they don't look at it. And I'm living proof. Now to move on to our closing remarks. Each candidate has 90 seconds, and we will begin with Pastor Manny. I'll end where I be, uh, began. Restore power to people. You are the people, and oftentimes when our power goes out, and, 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 and that's meant to be uh, new, as nuanced as it seems. There's a lot in that statement, restore power to people. When the power goes out, we're sitting around wondering, when are the lights going to go on? Uh, uh, how long is it going to be? Is my food going to go bad? Am I going to be able to plug in my medical operate, my, my power operated medical device? Uh, uh, am I going to be able to have lights on to, to, to be able to maneuver and navigate in the morning? I'm, am I going to be able to have air conditioning again? Restore power to the people. Where does that begin? With accountability of our utility, with affordability of our utility, and making sure it's reliable, renewable, and equitable for all people. I have been a change agent. Listen. Uh, for the last 18 years, uh, uh, in the enough of time that my, my little nephew has gone from pre-K to kindergarten to junior high to, 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 to high school to graduation uh, from, from high school, we have had one uh, person in office. Now it's time to graduate. Now it's time to go to the next level. During these next six years, we're going to see a lot of money come down from the federal government. And I am so excited that we have an opportunity to seize on this historic moment to see innovations and technology and money creating jobs for our young black men and women and people of all races so that we can come up as a state. 
I'm looking forward to that. I will run for you. I will be a champion for you like I always have been. I will use my voice. I will use the power that is in the PSC, but the, even the power just to sitting in that seat to come out of that chair and advocate for you. ElectMeManicForChange.com. Go ahead and pass the mic over to Mr. Jones. Great. Listen, I apologize because I'm not just a man that has the opportunity preach every Sunday or teach Bible study on the <laughs> I apologize that I'm not Mr. Wimante, right, that had the opportunity to take debate classes and teach debate classes. I apologize that I'm not Commissioner Bossier with a big call, a big, big political name. But what I don't apologize about is that my word is my mind. I don't apologize about that I want to fight for you to the end. I don't apologize about I would not throw the rocket out of my hand. If I tell you I'm with you, I'm with you. If I tell you I'm against you, I'm against you. I've always been that way, and I'm going to always be that way. You can look around the room, you can ask, pick up, so and ask some people who I am. If I tell you my word is my bond, my word is my bond. You can depend on me. You can believe in me. You can take my word and I say I'm going to do it for you or do it for your organization. That's what you get. You, you get what you, what you see is what you get. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go over to Ms. Commissioner Bossier, please. Thank you. And this is the closing statement. There's no yes. other question. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank the organization for putting this event on and uh, giving us the opportunity to have such a lively, lively evening with you and uh, discuss some of the uh, issues that matter to the Public Service Commission and to the voters. Uh, I'm proud to in, 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 have an interchange and, and uh, dialogue with my fellow opponents before all of you, so you can understand who we are and what we stand for. I, I know that when you look at the issues, when you look at the things that are discussed, and you look at some of the things that, that have been brought out today, they're very, very intriguing. But the number one thing that we have to remember is this race is about people, about helping people, about helping uh, customers and ratepayers throughout this entire state. And the fact of the matter is, when you look at the experience, when you look at who understands the job, I absolutely have the experience and I understand all these things. And like they mentioned, we are at a cusp in our time, and I've prepared myself well for this time. I prepared myself at the time when we are now turning the corner and you don't see status quo. You see change happening in the renewable energy markets that are here now. You see even energy asking for solar. That's an unbelievable day that we finally achieved. And you're not even the federal government making investments. I've worked hard to see these things happen and I want to see them through. I'm not going to give you promises. I'll give you action. I'm not going to tell you what might happen if I get it. I'll tell you how it works and how it should be done. I'll tell you what I voted for because I have a record. <coughs> and once again, I want to thank my fellow opponents and thank uh, uh, both for giving us this opportunity. And have a great night. Thank, thank you, Mr. Bossier. And last but not least, Mr. Lewis. Thank you. I want to thank you uh, both for this opportunity and, and to uh, my fellow competitors for a lively uh, discussion. I, I always say that policy is my love language. And I showcase my love for people by the policies I push and for the things that I do. We know our storms are getting stronger, our bills are higher, our power grid is less reliable and unsustainable. In this moment, we cannot wait. It is time for a new generation and new bold solutions. We must clean up our grid. We must invest in green jobs. We must tackle corruption. Uh, and we must protect our ratepayers. I'm a candidate that dares to dream because I strongly believe in the promise of our future and not of the hold of what is today. I am committed to doing this work and my history has shown from Congress to the state legislature to across this country I have fought for people and I will continue fighting for people. I will hold those in power accountable and make sure that we center people at every center of the time. This is our moment, and we cannot squander it by doing the same thing that we have done before. Louisiana cannot wait. 
Our climate cannot wait. Our people cannot wait. And that moment requires new leadership. And that's why I'm running for Public Service Commission, because I strongly believe it is time to bring power back to our people and to hold the rich and powerful accountable. We can do it together. Thank you very much. We appreciate all of your responses. I'd like to now pass it.